Hey Bethel, I'm Bellamy and I've just been feeling this stirring to share a word with you guys. Um, when I was asked to do this devotional series, I kept asking God what he wanted me to share and what he wanted me to say, what I had to say that was worth sharing with the entire church. And he pointed me to something that he's been teaching me personally, which is the power of a pure heart and genuine action. In scripture, God says, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. That's Matthew 5 verse 8. Um, I think that for two years, Bethel has been pressing in to God and asking for revival and asking him to move. On Sunday mornings, we've been stirred to repent, and during our worship nights, we've seen incredible acts of God and just seen him move in such powerful ways. But I think that we're called to experience something deeper and that he's going to show us something even more than we've seen already and this huge outpouring of his spirit. The power of a pure heart produces genuine action, and a genuine spirit produces repentance um, and a spirit of longing to see God. And most importantly, a pure heart gives us eyes to see God, and that is what we want. I think at Bethel, God is calling us to repent and seek more of Him, and we can only start with a pure heart. When we begin to prioritize purifying our hearts and our relationship with God, then we can actively seek a more personal relationship with Him and we can see Him move in such a powerful way. This is something that we've been praying into for two years and God has been really pushing us to pray and to repent. And I think that it begins with a pure heart and that's how we can bring other non-believers to Christ and we can bring more people to church and show them God's love and we can experience God in a new way for ourselves. Even people who have been following him for two years or 20 years can see a, an incredible move of God and just experience him in a new way. So I encourage you to press in and get to know him better and be in the word and actively seek him and start asking him to stir you to repent and give you a heart that wants to see more of him and see more of his spirit and see the glory that comes when he walks into the room. Amen. I don't know about you, but I love when Gen Z shares the gospel. I love it. This new generation that we have now, this generation that's coming right now, is powerful. And I'm telling you right now that we have to grab a hold of that as a church and embrace it, and understand that they hear from God too. Amen? Uh, Bellamy pointed out what God has done, but also what we must do to see more, and it starts with purity. So today, I'm going to talk about purity. Uh, we oftentimes associate the word purity with sex, right? That's, that's what we do. We, we, we oftentimes associate that word purity with uh, some kind of sexual act or whatever it may be. Or keeping yourself pure as we hopefully teach our kids uh, before marriage, that kind of thing. It absolutely does mean that. But I want to show you a deeper definition of what purity actually is. Okay? So this is not one of those less. Some of you guys are like, oh, we're going to talk about sex in church. We're not going to do that today. Maybe soon, but not today. <laughs> but I want to show you what purity actually is. Okay? So purity actually is the condition or quality of being pure. Freedom from anything, I love this, anything that debases, contaminates, pollutes, etc. That is what purity actually is. It goes on to say, freedom from any admixture or modifying addition. Everybody with me so far? The term free from lust is often mentioned parallel with purity. But lust is not always a sexual sin, which we like to associate that with. Understand this. It is absolutely, parents, listen to me. It is absolutely vital that we talk about and practice and teach our kids sexual purity in our current cultural climate. It is, man, I should get some amens on this. Come on. <laughs> Wake up, first service. We should be teaching that. We should absolutely be teaching that, uh, especially the cultural climate that we're living in right now. It is a crazed cultural climate. But what if instead of talking about sexual purity all the time, we think of it as a moral purity? That the Bible, when it speaks about purity, is speaking about keeping ourselves from sin. 
as a whole. When Jesus in the Bible speaks of purity, it is speaking of something far deeper and more universal than one subject. Purity is not merely an issue of lust that struggling men and women need to be concerned about. It's an issue of the heart. Purity is an issue of the heart. Sinful acts are a byproduct of an impure heart. When you commit sin, when sin takes place in our life, it's not we look at this and go, okay, I struggle with that sin. No, I struggle with impurity in my heart. That's where that comes from. So sin is not, and don't take this the wrong way, sin is not necessarily the problem. Sin is the byproduct of what the problem is, which is impurity in our hearts. I want to say this before we jump into more. Complete purity is not possible due to the sin nature we are born with. Understand this. This side of heaven, we will always struggle. We'll always struggle with impurity, impure thoughts, impure actions. We'll always struggle with it. But it doesn't mean you have to live in that captivity. It means there is freedom in Jesus. See, no one in this room can reach Feel full purity because complete purity is having no desire at all, which we know is impossible. Amen? Impossible. But we can allow the Holy Spirit to create in us a pure heart as David prayed in the psalm. Create in me a clean heart, a pure heart, O oh God. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Cast me not away from your presence. We can have this heart's cry, if you will. So let, let's dig in a little bit. What's purity all about? To be simple, it's about one word, wholeness. Wholeness. Everybody say that with me. Wholeness. In Matthew 5, 8, the, the scripture that Bellamy used, I'm just going to use that because that's powerful. Jesus used the word purity in a way that is not always thought about. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Jesus isn't pointing to a sexual purity or even a moral purity. He is pointing us to a spiritual purity or a purity of the heart. Once you start looking for this in the Bible, you see it's everywhere, all over the pages. But what does it mean? The best way to think about purity of heart is to consider the way purity describes any other physical thing. The Bible uses the term pure to speak of gold. In Revelation 21, he talks about the pure, pure gold that's there. While this speaks to a lack of blemish, it deals with something far more molecular than that. For something to be pure gold means that it's gold and nothing else. Nothing else. Do you think, uh, this is great, I learned this from a jeweler, which I should have already known, but I'm a little slow sometimes with my Alabama thinking. You get a ring, and you're like going, this is gold, this is gold. You realize it's not pure gold, right? Because if it's pure gold, it'll be liquid. It'll just run off your finger. You wouldn't even be able to wear it if it's pure gold, right? So purity has no blemishes. And when you're talking about gold, and you're talking about pure gold, anything other than gold would be a blemish. So it becomes liquefied to make it pure gold. That's why it's so weird when you think about the streets of heaven being pure gold. Nothing has blemishes in God, right? So how is it possible for it to be pure gold if it's liquefied? We don't know. So let's not try to figure it out. I'm not. Purity communicates wholeness, not partially one thing and partially another, wholeness. For someone to be pure in heart, it means their heart is set on one thing and nothing else. It is wholly directed toward one thing. For us to truly be concerned about purity, we must be concerned about where our affections and our devotions lie. We have to be. While the Bible is certainly concerned with sexual purity, it's far more concerned with the purity of the heart. While physical adultery is a sin, it's symptomatic of a far deeper issue, spiritual immature, or impurity. I guess you could say immaturity too, right? You're supposed to laugh at that. I mean, what's, where are y'all at today? I guess, come on, stay with me a little bit. We as flawed humanity, how many would admit we're all flawed? We as flawed humanity often see things from outward appearances 
And we base our stance on that rather than seeing a change that is taking place. Also known as trusting God's process in our individual lives. For instance, I'm going to tell you about a guy. Uh, this guy uh, is newly saved. Uh, matter of fact, he got baptized in 2023. He got baptized this year. He is interning and, and mentoring with a seasoned pastor. He sh- does street evangelism. He meets with people, and he's seeing, he's seeing God use him in deliverance. He's seeing demons cast out of people. Listen, if you don't believe that, read the Bible. Uh, he's seeing this take place. He's seeing people be set free by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's preaching the gospel. He's, he's going after it. He's got some rough edges, but he's going after Jesus with everything he has. Now, listening to what I just told you, would it be possible for this guy to be a lead pastor? I'm asking. This is, this is going to be an interaction time. Would it be possible for him to be a lead pastor? Yeah, okay. So you think he's got the qualifications, right, to be a lead pastor? Eventually, eventually. He's learning, right? Okay, I want to introduce you to Richie. <laughs> Leave it on the screen for a minute. Would you hire him as your pastor? No. God forbid, no. <laughs> Maybe. So you see the, the controversy I'm causing right now. And I love it because it makes us think for a minute. You see, what we do is we say, there's no way I'd let that guy be the pastor of a church. What God says is he pure in heart? Has repentance taken place in his life? Is he a different person? Is he allowing the Spirit of God to use him? Is people, are people being preached the gospel to despite the way he looks? Is that what's taking place here? Some people said no. Some people said yes. He wouldn't even get an interview. But let me explain something to you. Is he perfect? No. Second question, are you? We oftentimes see purity as something that is visible. But it is actually what God is doing in you that changes us. The outside habits and behaviors will change. But it is a process. If we have to, if this guy had to go get every tattoo removed, everything about him changed before he came to Jesus, nobody in this room or this planet would be saved. Ever. When Jesus was... On the Galilean hillside, speaking those words in Matthew 5, he was taking the listeners on a journey of understanding the deeper things of God. You can take that picture down now if you'd like. You know, some of you are going, I don't know if I, I don't know. <laughs> Bottom line is we can never clean up our own hearts enough to be acceptable to a holy God. And that's why we need perfect Righteousness that Jesus provides for all who come to the cross, including the guy in the picture. Here's a little context of when Jesus was speaking this. I love context. Listen, when you're studying the word, if you're looking at the word, please, please look at the context of where, how it's spoken and, and the, the surrounding things of scripture. Jesus came into a world when Israel was a, in a desperate condition, Okay? Desperate condition, politically, economically, spiritually, they were in trouble, all right? They couldn't keep the law no matter how hard they tried, and they were people that were crying out for a Savior. They needed something because they they were having a hard time keeping the law. They knew that God is holy and God is righteous, so their question was, what must they do in order to enter the presence of a holy God? How can they do this? What kind of righteousness must we have before we can be accepted into the kingdom of heaven? What does God require? How good do we need to be? I mean, all these questions are going through these people's heads, right? And then Jesus speaks, and he says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, 
There's two parts to this scripture, and I'm going to share both parts, and I'm going to kind of dissect them a little bit. But blessed are the pure in heart. The gospel of Jesus Christ is concerned with the heart. It speaks to the heart. Matter of fact, you can go back to the Old Testament and see that when, when David was there, and God says, uh, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Right? God looks at the heart of who we are. We need intellect as well as will and emotion. These things all come together in the heart. God's test, God, God tests a man's character, his ethics, his morals. He measures man by his own unchangeable absolute wholeness, which is the pure in heart. To be pure in heart is to love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's how you become someone with a pure heart. Listen, now, you think, well, what about sin? For all have fallen and fall, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? We know that. And we all mess up on occasion, right? How many, how many mess up on occasion? Man, I'm right there with you. We all mess up on occasion. We do stupid things. We do things that we shouldn't do. Uh, I'm going to tell a story. I'm going I'm to tell you an Eve story real quick. I wasn't going to do this because it makes me, I'm afraid makes me look bad, but don't, because I didn't do it, so it doesn't make me look bad at all. <laughs> we went to the Badlands last week, had a great time with some family in town, and we went to the gift shop after the Badlands were over. I've told some of you this story already, but uh, we go to the Badlands when, the, when the, the little loop's over, and we're looking at it, I'm about 20 feet away from my kid, and my little seven-year-old is over there, and she's looking at all the toys, you know, they get enamored by all the toys and stuff, so she's sitting there, and I just glance over at her, and I see her take her hand out of her pocket. Like, okay, so I walk over there to her, and I said, Eve, did you just steal that? And she looks at me, and she goes. And so I reach my hand in her pocket, and I pull out these three little shiny. It's just like Satan. These little shiny little rocks, these smooth little shiny rocks that are about this high off the ground. My seven-year-old is about this high off the ground. They are right in front. It's like Satan just putting temptation right in front of it. And she's over here, and she's like, ooh, that's a pretty one. That's a pretty one. She's putting them in her pocket. So I take them out of her pocket. I throw them back. How many of you got kids that are thieves? <laughs> um, and so I'm sitting there, and I'm like, oh, Lord. And I looked at her, and I said, Eve, you just stole that. You just stole that. And she goes, Dad, I'm sorry for stealing. And I said, don't tell me. Tell Jesus you've sinned against him and him alone. I'm kidding. I didn't do that. But I, uh, I, uh, they're from there. I'm taking about, I'm going, I'm a pastor. My kid's a klepto. She would come home with a bike one day. I'm like, where'd you get the bike? I don't know. Nobody was riding it, so I figured it was free. We all are going to mess up. We're all going to have these moments of stupidity or, or mess-ups, right? That's not what the, the pure in heart is about. I can have a pure heart and mess up because I'm human. I have a human nature. I have a sin nature inside of me. So those moments of mess-ups don't define who you are in your heart. However, however, our goal should be to always strive to be holy. The striving should be there. The Greek word for pure in Matthew 5.8 is katharis. It means to be clean, blameless, unstained from guilt. Interestingly, the word can refer specifically to that which is purified by fire or by pruning. Now, if you think about that for a minute, what does God do when you get saved? Upon salvation, you go through this pruning process. If you're really going after Jesus, you go through this pruning process where he starts, the Holy Spirit begins convicting you of things in your life that shouldn't be there. Remove this. Remove this. You need to rid yourself of this. Why? Because that's what purifies you. That's what gets you pure. John the Baptist told people that Jesus would baptize them with, whole, with the Holy Spirit and fire Okay, that's not the same thing. We look at the Holy Spirit, we go, Holy Spirit, fire. No, Holy Spirit is a being that can baptize you, that comes inside of you upon salvation, that can do great things in your life. The fire part is the purification process that we go through to rid ourselves from sin. 
to get those things out of our lives. The conviction. Conviction is a Christian's best friend. If you're convicted about something, praise God for it. Because it means the Holy Spirit's beginning to speak to you and dealing with you about certain things. Jesus refers to believers as being the branches and to himself as being the vine. Malachi speaks of the Messiah as being like a refiner's fire in Malachi 3.2. When Jesus speaks of the vine, a vine, for it to produce fruit, it must be pruned. Those who are truly pure then are those who have been declared innocent because of the work of Jesus and who are being sanctified by his refining fire and his pruning. We have the authority inside of us by the Jesus that lives inside of us to declare this over our lives. When you get saved, do you know the first time you declare something in the name of Jesus is the day you get saved? The day you come to salvation? You're declaring this blood, his body that was broken over yourself and saying, I now receive that as my own. Then he speaks about the heart. So the Greek word for heart in Matthew 5, 8 is cardia. This can be applied to the physical heart, okay? But it also refers to the spiritual center of life, all right? It's where thoughts, desires, sense of purpose, will, understanding, and character all reside. So to be pure in heart means to be blameless in who we actually are. Being pure in heart involves having a singleness of heart towards God. A pure heart has no hypocrisy, no guile, no hidden motives. The pure heart is marked by transparency and an uncompromising desire to please God in all things. It is more than an external purity of behavior. It is an internal purity of the soul. That's being whole. So Jesus goes and he says, blessed are the pure in heart. Then he says something that absolutely throws off everybody who's listening to him. It just totally takes them off guard. He says, for they shall see God. Now you got to understand in this context, in this culture, at this time, this was something that Jesus said that was almost um, taboo, I guess if you will. Like it was a, he was, they, they were genuinely frightened when he says this. See, Jesus had a way of catching people off guard, right? If you ever read the writings of Jesus and the things Jesus said, he had this way of catching them off guard. And with this verbiage, he did just that. He inadvertently addressed Jewish legalism by saying this. He inadvertently addressed legalism in the Jewish culture by saying, they shall see God. The minds of many Jews must have raced back to Psalm 24, all right, where it says this, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. David does not say those things, that, that those who ascend the hill of the Lord and stand in his holy place are those who tried hard to keep the law and all its added laws. He didn't say that. But only one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Funny coming from a guy like David. Right? His hands weren't clean. His heart wasn't pure. He lusted after Bathsheba. Right? He steals her. Gets her husband killed. He does all this. He's got blood on his hands. He's got impure in his heart. And he says these words. Only those with clean hands and a pure heart. The phrase that Jesus used had all the people a bit on edge. And the last part of that scripture, for they shall see God, was nerve-wracking for them. To the crowd on the hillside, seeing God was a frightening thing. This is why. On Mount Sinai, in Exodus chapter 20, when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. Listen to this. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. All right? They remember this. There are not many in the Old Testament that saw God and lived, and they didn't see the full glory or they would have not survived. Moses saw the veiled glory of God. If you remember, 
I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock, and I'll walk past you. And what happened? Moses shined brightly and had to wear a veil over his face when he was around people, or they would have killed him. And that was just God walking past him. Isaiah saw a portion of it. Ezekiel saw some. But to God, to see God was deadly. In Exodus 33, 20, God told Moses, You cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Now, all these Jewish people who knew this, who knew these stories, who knew what happened, were frightened at this point when Jesus looks at them and says, Shall see God. They're like, Whoa, wait a minute. So if I'm pure in heart, I'm going to die. Like, immediately, that's what they're thinking. Yet Jesus says to Philip in John 14, 9, Have I been with you so long, and you still not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Jesus is saying that the pure in heart shall see God. This is a promise that is partially fulfilled here and now for the redeemed and will be complete in heaven in Christ Jesus. We'll see the blazing glory of the light of God in eternity. But until that time, we see him with the eye of faith. Everybody with me so far? We are seeing a generation. Listen, we are seeing a generation rise up who may not act or think like we older people do, but they have a heart that longs for an authentic Savior. They long for it. They want it. I, um, I'm going to try not to take too much time, but I, I had the honor of going to the youth camps this, this year and, and, and doing like a breakout session for them. And I did this breakout session was how Gen Z affects the future of the church. And I let them talk. And I just said, I want to ask you some questions. And I said, what is one thing that you wish that older generations knew about your generation? And this girl steps up and she says, and you could tell she was the popular girl. She was, she was the one who everybody looked at and they were all staring at her. And she said, I wish they knew that I can hear from God too. That's what they said. I wish they knew that I have the ability to hear from God as well. And I thought to myself, man, we have to do a better job of affirming that and walking them through that. I've heard God speak this, because she told me, she said, I've been dismissed recently when I said that I felt like God told me something. I was dismissed by an older person. And I'm thinking to myself, we can't do that anymore, church. We're in a generation right now who's powerful, and they're at a crossroads and they're either going to go towards Jesus or towards the world. They're not going to go in the middle like we did or we had the ability to do. They're going to go one or the other. Why? Because they are a completely loyal generation that gets fired up for something and goes after it with everything they have. So they're either going to be on fire for the world or a fire for Jesus, and we better start pushing them towards Jesus. Too many times the church has preached a synthetic Savior that says this or that is acceptable and this or that is not. The heart that goes after Jesus with all purity is the one that will see the glory of God and encounter his power. Revivals will break out when we get to the point where we say, what happened in the past doesn't matter anymore. I'm going for what God has for me now. That's when we'll see a move of God. We will continue as a church to seek God for revival. We will continue to seek God for healing. We will continue to seek God for salvation, for deliverance, and for our city to be stirred by the power and the spirit of God. But as we do, let's aim together to seek him with our whole heart and our entire being and strive for a pure heart as the family of God that are anointed for such a time as this. We are anointed for the time we live in right now. And God wants to do something in our church. He wants to do something through the hearts of every individual in this room. But it's going to be up to us to say, okay, God, I surrender. I surrender to you. So this morning, 
as we think about these things, as we think about this pure in heart. I'm not going to ask you to look at, examine yourself to see if, if uh, you're pure in heart because sometimes that's just hard to look at. That's hard to see. I can't sit here and go, I'm totally pure in heart. But what I can do is I can say, okay, do I have things in my life that needs to be removed? Is, is the Spirit of God convicting me about things right now that maybe shouldn't be there? Maybe you're doing things that nobody knows about. And God's going, you need to get rid of those things in your life. Maybe you're, you're in a relationship that's, that's actually it's, it's contaminating you. It's contaminating your spirit because of the things that this relationship is bringing about. Those are things we got to look at. Those are things we have to examine ourselves for. I can't tell you that's what you're dealing with, but you can because you know. You know what's in your heart. I don't. So this morning as we pray, maybe you say, I need prayer for something. You need prayer for something. Listen, these altars are always open. This is not, this is not a strange land up here. We should be living on the altar. We should be living on the altar. So I'm going to encourage you today. If that's you, if you need prayer, if you need to repent, maybe you need to just in a symbolic gesture, lay something down at the altar. I want to encourage you today to do that. I'll help you out. Everybody stand up. Sometimes it's easier when everybody's standing. And we're going to close in just a few minutes. Pastor Beth's going to come up here and close us out in just a few minutes. But I just want to give you that opportunity. If that's you and you say, I need, I need to repent. I need to get rid of some things. I need to start pushing myself towards that wholeness and that purity of, purity of heart. I'm going to encourage you right now. I'm going I'm to pray for you. And as we pray, I'm going to encourage you to step out from where you're at and find a spot at this altar if you need to. But that's on you. You've got you've to do it. So Jesus, right now I ask you, God, as we all stand here, Lord, in your presence, as we all stand here before you, God, we know you're holy. We know you're righteous. We know that you're all powerful, and we admit that. God, show us the things in our lives that we need to surrender to you. God, those areas, Lord, that maybe we haven't given up fully, and we need to do that. God, I ask you right now to begin to prompt hearts, begin to prompt us, begin to stir inside of us, Lord, the need, the need for repentance, the need for laying it all down before you. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, I need to lay my relationship down. I need to lay it down before Jesus because right now it's not holy. I need to lay it down. Maybe you're here and you say, I need, I, I just, I need more of him. These things I got in my life, I know there's certain areas in my life that I need to get rid of, and today I need to lay that down. If you don't want to come up front, then do it right where you're at. But just do it. Lord, I ask you to help us. Help us to be a church that's, that's repentant. Help us to be a church that goes after the holiness of God.